Welcome to the virtual event space for the Center for Fiction. I'm thrilled to welcome you here tonight as we continue our fabulous partnership with Theater Communications Group uh, and their book program especially. Uh, we did events in the past with uh, Jackie Sibley's Drury and Claudia Rankin and Annie Baker and Brandon Jacob Jenkins. And we're very excited to, um, to be working together again tonight. Um, for those of you who don't know, the Center for Fiction is the only literary nonprofit that focuses on the creation and enjoyment of fiction, but we love to celebrate storytelling across genres and also in the real world, we are across the street from BAM and right beside theater for a new audience. So we love uh, theater as well. And uh, let's see. Just a little housekeeping thing. We will do an audience Q&A today, but please put your questions uh, in the Q&A forum. So click where it says Q&A at the bottom of your screen and type them in there at any point. And um, we will uh, go to the questions in the last 10, 15 minutes of the show. Um, and you're welcome to use the chat to say hello and um, you know put your enthusiastic responses in there, but don't put your questions in the chat. All right, with uh, all of that said, it is my pleasure to now introduce you to Erica Lauren Ortiz from Theater Communication Group, who's going to tell you a little bit about what they do and introduce our guest, Erica. Thank you so much, Melanie. Uh, my name is Erica Lauren Ortiz. I use she, her pronouns, and I'm zooming in from Lenape Hoking, uh, the unceded lands of the, of the Lenape, uh, known as Bergen County, New Jersey. Uh, so TCG Books, we commit to writers, not only to a particular play, and we work with playwrights throughout the life of their careers. As part of this four decade long commitment, uh, TCG Books has also published Paula Vogel's first major collection, the Baltimore Waltz and other plays in 1995. And we've also published five other books for Paula, which include her Pulitzer Prize winning, How I Learned to Drive and Indecent. Uh, every year TCG commits to adding new authors to our list. And because of this, our rich list of authors, which is far too long to name, includes uh, everyone from Stephen Soundheim to Stephen Ali Girgis. David Henry Wong, Brandon Jacob Jenkins, as we mentioned, Young Jean Lee, Lynn Nottish, Susan Laurie Parks, August Wilson, and so many others. And we are so excited and honored to work with all of these authors. And recently we had the great privilege of adding uh, Heidi Schreck and forming a relationship with her and publishing her vital and important, What the Constitution Means to Me in 2021. So we hope that this will be the first book of many uh, for Heidi and uh, the first book, of course, with us of many. So at this time, it is my great honor to welcome both Heidi Schreck and Paula Vogel to the screen and to turn it over to these wonderful artists and TCG authors. Thank you so much. Thank you, Lauren. Erica. Um, and uh, thanks to TCG and thanks to Center for Fiction. And thank you, Heidi Schreck. Congratulations, you are uh, in print now. Yes. <laughs> it's, it's a strange process, isn't it? Taking what is something that's a living performance that has all of these extemporaneous elements, then how do you put that on the page? Yes, it's, uh, it, it was actually quite difficult um, in some ways. And my wonderful editor, Kathy Sullivan knows this, <laughs> to commit to a sort of fixed version. Partic I mean, it's actually, that's true of me whenever I write a play, but particularly for this show, because uh, it evolved over time. There were parts of it um, that, you know, I discovered while performing in front of an audience and then decided to fold into the play. Um, uh, the debate at the end has extemporaneous pieces to it. Um, so I, 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 I got kind of panicked when I had to fix it because I thought this is not, this is not what this is. This is meant to be this very live um, uh, thing. Um, but I finally decided it was, it was important to get it out there. People had been waiting for over a year. <laughs> Right. And I decided that I would have to put the imperfect fixed version out into the world. 
what what I particularly loved in in reading it uh, yesterday, I mean, I've seen it on Amazon, and I have to tell you, only once before in my life did I go in to see a matinee, turn around, rip up the ticket that I paid for for the evening performance, go to the box office, and get another ticket for what the Constitution means to me. Um, it just, there was no other way I wanted to spend that evening than back in the theater. And so I got to see two very different debates at the end, which was so intoxicating. And I think the only way you can do it is to go and see it at numerous nights. So in a way, you and everybody who worked on it, like the wonderful stage manager, Terry Kohler, um, you know, Mike, who plays the Legionnaire, um, all everybody who's on the stage production possibly has an awareness of really how breathing and living what the Constitution means to me is in a way that audience members don't. We usually just see a show once. But what's interesting about it is that it seems to me that we use the words living and breathing to apply to the Constitution. It's a living and breathing document. So is your play. Um, and it, it has a dynamic of performance and text that's just extraordinary. So um, I have to tell you, I have always wanted to see your work. I, I love Clubbed Thumb, I'm a, I'm a, but I'm now living you know, way up on the Cape. And I figure, well, I'll catch up. I'll catch up on the page. I'm really sorry I didn't get down to see Creatures. Everyone told me it was remarkable. Last night, I just read uh, Grand Concourse. Oh, wow. Thank you. What gorgeous writing. But this is in another category. And this isn't really a play. I'm really happy. I want as many people as possible to read the play. But there's something that you do that I feel that performance uh, really shows us, which is your ability to forthrightly present yourself to an audience of strangers every night. The story that you've crafted, and yes, I agree with you, it's very well crafted. Um, I love it when you <laughs> say this at some point, it's, you know, there really is a structure to this. There really is a damn structure. I mean, I've been studying it. Um, but but there's, there, there is a, an element of emotional risk taking that this piece, basically says the only way that we're going to move forward is if each of us comes forward and bears witness and particularly as women. So there are, there are a number of pitfalls that I see that you have gracefully jumped over. But before I, so <laughs> do you want to say anything about that? I mean, I know, I know sure. it, did it get easier to come forward like that to an audience in time? It, it definitely got easier. First, let me say, I am so, um, uh, thank you for telling me that you came twice <laughs> and that you came and came back. Um, you're, I, I've said this before, but I, like for many of us, many writers uh, in the theater, you, um, you have just been a sort of beacon for me. I first saw Baltimore Waltz when I was in college at the Oregon Shakespeare Festival and how I learned to drive made a huge impact uh, on my life and also on, on the subjects I thought one could write about. Um, so I just want to say when I heard, and I did hear, I think someone at the box office told me. <laughs> so I actually heard that day. When I heard you had come back, I was incredibly moved. And also, um, uh, yes, and, and, and have always wanted you to know like how, what an impact your work has had on, on me. So I, first I want to say that, thank you. Um, thank you. Uh, yes, I will say that the structure, it's funny because I, I feel like, um, first of all, everyone, Terry Kohler, our amazing stage manager, Arabella Powell, um, Noah Silva, Mike, Rosdelli, and Thursday are debaters. Not only did everyone know what a living, breathing sort of um, fluid thing it was, but everyone also participated in that and sort of held, made that possible. Terry and Arabella, for one thing, would 
take copious notes so that if I, you know, if I added something more than three nights in a row, they would put it in the script and flag it for me. And so, and, and also they would come in as would the young debaters, as would Mike with uh, new ideas for the debate each night or for the cross-examination. So we all, Noah Silva, our assistant stage manager was hugely, um, made a huge contribution to the debate. So we became like a little team of people all thinking about this document and about our country and what was going on and trying to bring that together to the stage. And I feel incredibly lucky to have been surrounded by such brilliant people. Um, I am not, I am not a particularly um, extroverted person, which I know seems absurd to say given the play, um, nor am I a person who in my life has, has shared intimate, I, I, I'm pretty private. Um, and I, I actually found that the structure of the play is what led me to the kind of openness and vulnerability around sharing my own family history and my own, for example, um, experience of having an abortion. Um, I, I chose the structure first. I wanted to make a play about this contest I did as a kid and the, the, a structure that both seemed fun and seemed right was to, to take the actual structure of the contest and just put it on stage and see what would happen if I went through that again, but now, you know, 30 years later as an adult and tried to take kind of the prompt of the contest seriously. Um, I mean, not that I didn't take it seriously at 15, I just, I had been through less things. Um, Yes. And so, <laughs> yeah. So when I started to do that, I, I, I really feel like the structure of the piece is what led me to the content. And I, and I realized, oh, if I'm going to talk about my personal relationship to this amendment, and I did deliberately choose a really juicy amendment, obviously, uh, I'm going to have to talk about some of the cases and the cases that relate to my life are Roe v. Wade and Griswold versus Connecticut and Gonzalez versus Castle Rock, which is about domestic violence, because I have this long history of violence and sexual assault in my, on my maternal line. Um, and I really, uh, I honestly felt pretty sick to my stomach when I realized that it, it felt to me that's what the play was asking of me. Yes. And I really didn't want to do it. Yes. I, I'm not a smoker anymore, but I smoke cigarettes. I, I, I remember canceling a rehearsal at Club Thumb, being just like, I'm in my bed and I don't feel like talking about this stuff. Um, and then gradually, really with the support of Oliver Butler, my director and the people around me, it became easier and easier. My set designer, Rachel Houck, like everyone was so supportive and present. And we talked really early on about that, about it. I, the, the structure of the play having set a sort of dialectic in motion and that it was like the constitution. It was this living, changing thing. And, and it was right. a thing that was gonna be grappled with kind of in real time. And everyone saw it that way and supported me in that. And because of them, it got easier and easier. And then once I started performing and, and realizing how people were responding to it and, and that it was meaningful to them, then that, made it exponentially easier. I have never seen people in an audience um, communicate with a performer on stage and with each other. It was a, a very live, active conversation happening in the audience where your bravery in coming forth and witnessing, there were, there were a lot of witnessing stories out in the lobby and onward into the night after people saw what the constitution means to me. And what's interesting about this, I mean, a couple of, of, of things I thought about when How I Learned to Drive came out, um, it is absolutely autobiographical. And I made, a, um, I made an agreement with my mother uh, that I would not out her because of course, and, and this is, I think, also the extraordinary generosity um, that you're showing to your mother. Um, my mother wanted her own right to privacy. Um, and it was the only time in her life that she came and saw one of my shows. Oh, wow. And I just thought, you know, 
right back then we were called confessional. Anytime a woman wrote yep. about her own life material, which is all we have as writers, we were called con confessional. Now I believe the word is autofiction. Yeah, yes. Yeah. Um, autofiction, oh, is that what O'Neill wrote? Autofiction, is that what Williams wrote? Autofiction, right. is that what Hemingway wrote? I mean, we can go on and on and on with it. And I, I am still resisting using or, or allowing us to be put into any slot. On the other hand, by your example, coming forward means that yes, our lives are worth being public on stage. And why that's important as you so beautifully delineate in the course of the evening is that our bodies aren't seen. Our bodies, as you go like this, is not in this constitution, is not in this document. We need to show that. Um, we need to, to document personally all of the things that are not protected, or as you would say, the negative rights. Now, one of the things that I struggled with before I wrote How I Learned to Drive, the play before that was hot and throbbing. And I experienced a lot of domestic violence in my house. And I have struggled for a very long time. And it's interesting, I watched your audience, Heidi, because it, it seems to me that one of the struggles we have is presenting something about abortion, domestic violence or rape in such a way that every man in the audience doesn't suddenly feel like they've got the mark of Cain on their forehead. You know, how do you say to men, and you do, you do, you basically come right out there and say, I love men. Um, how do you let men into the conversation so that they can get past their guilt for what other men have done? And it's so interesting in the structure in that you just lightheartedly say as a 15 year old, well, let's say you decided to murder or rape me. <laughs> and I would say, no, no, I'm a person. Um, so how did you, I know you thought about this because it is structured <laughs> in there. Yes. About how in a way are you putting the frog into the pot of water and then turning up the heat to say, yes, this is what happens um so that you don't lose the men in the audience i think that's a great question i i feel like um well another thing the piece became about that i wasn't expecting was the sort of deconstruction of my own um persona my own mask as like a you know cis white straight woman and and the things i do i'm a very smiley person and uh <laughs> the things i do to you know navigate the world that right, have been right. very useful to me um and uh and some you know whatever there's a lot to say about that but i i think i felt like i remembered what i was like as a teenager winning those contests and one of the things i used was my sweetness and my charm and and the parts of me that like had learned to be really um accommodating i guess and so it felt like that's how I should start the play. And that also felt like it sort of maybe allowed people who might not otherwise listen to be taken off guard and sort of enjoy themselves <laughs> uh, and be and listen to me before, you know, I was able to drop that mask. So I would say those those two things sort of came about at the same time. The thing, the same thing I used to get people to listen to me as a 15 year old. I kind of used in the show. I will also say that I, I did feel like there was, it was important. First of all, I'm grateful to my mom that she was willing and okay about talking about it. And I, I knew she would be because she'd been very public as when I was a kid about her situation. Right. Secondly, I, I feel like um, I, I had grown up really not talking about what had gone on in my family. And I feel like there is a, um, uh, I guess I feel like it was important to talk about domestic abuse that is perpetrated by cis white men. And because I think sometimes it gets put on men of other races and it gets put on, um, you know, as we know, like domestic violence also really crosses class barriers. It's not, you know, it's just like, yes. So yeah. Yes. Yeah, so I really wanted 
I felt like talking about my family in that way was important. But yes, I will say the the thing I the the thing in myself that I use to win over kind of the old white cis male judges is the same thing I use in the show. <laughs> With little interjections of your 40 year old self, as you're saying, deconstructing the mask. Yes. So those, for those of us were like, you know, the, I mean, the <laughs> thing that's heartbreaking, there's something very heartbreaking about what the constitution means to me. And I think this hits each and every one of us who sat in the audience. And that is, I see a 15 year old who is passionate about it, who is absolutely idealistic. And then to have to turn around as a 40 year old something, you know, woman who now has that life experience and now has a greater awareness of what the constitution does not protect and whom it does not protect. And as we move forward to multiple deaths at the hands of police that are supposed to be um, uh, obeying laws, making sure that laws are obeyed rather than breaking them. There is this heartbreaking loss of innocence that we have, which is why it's so brilliant to bring on the teenage debaters at the end, if we can hear the constitution first in your 15 year old voice, but then in the voices of other young women, it so built back my resiliency. It, com it completely got me out of whatever kind of depression, pain, my own going to you know, the childhood hurts and my own losses of innocence to go, no, damn it, at the end of the day, there are all of these young people. You said something that was so extraordinary. You said something about that you find yourself now at your present age, feeling that younger people are shining a light in the darkness to lead you forward, to follow them. Um, that is so incredibly empathic. I don't know of another play that I feel has this empathy for audience um, that your, yours does. And you know, I, I know I'm just talking about the, yes, we do need to say to men that we love them, but, but you also give an incredible forgiveness, whether or not it's, I, it may take a lifetime for all of us to all the women in your lineage and to yourself. And if that's, also necessary for stepping forward. Um, this is a little uh, counterpoint, but I wanted to toss this out because there's something else as I was reading your play. I read it yesterday, I read it today. Um, I mean, I just wanna, I just wanna sink into the world of, of Heidi Schreck. I've, I'm gonna get all the other scripts. Um, <laughs> because really you, you do something that I feel not all writers do. Um, which is you, you think about the ending in a way that the ending reverberates beyond the lobby. So the play doesn't end. Your, your plays don't end. Um, they, are, they create ripples that build into a tidal wave for each audience member. So what I wanted to tell you very, very briefly is that when I was in grad school, I thought about writing a, a dissertation called The Balancing Act. And I was gonna do three case studies. One was of a play that was successful during the golden revolution in London in the 1680s between Tories and Whigs when there had just been a bloodless revolution, but there was the promise of a revolution. It was very, very live. And these people had just been killing each other. So if to have this hit in London with both sides intrigued me. Then there was the, the uh -huh. I'm thinking about doing it, uh, 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 the second part on the Octoroon. Uh -huh. No one can touch now that the brilliant Brandon yes. Jenkins. Yes. Um, <laughs> but you know, the fact that it was a hit in 1859 in New Orleans and in New York yep. was really kind of interesting. And then I thought there should be a play about abortion. This was in the 1970s. And I searched and I searched and I don't think anyone could write it then. 
I really, really don't. But I want to say that I feel that now I could write that dissertation. One of the things that what the Constitution does in, I think, a very remarkable way is it makes me realize in the same sentimental way we look back at how we loved the Constitution when we were 15 and taking problems of democracy courses, but also to recognize that we were being trained in a civil discourse. We were being trained in proposition opposition. We were being trained in the art of argument and the art of argument is the seed of drama that you have thesis yep. antithesis and you must show both sides. And what I felt <laughs> is that you were training me or reminding me that there was a time before talk radio and talk television with the Tucker Carlson's of this world or the Rachel Maddow's where we have ceased to have proposition, proposition opposition. We're all now on one side. But what the Constitution is doing is saying, come on, we can retrain ourselves. We can go back. And that was kind of an extraordinary thing. So um, I have a very pointed question for you now, and it's not a fair one. Great, I'm ready. <laughs> With what has just happened now in the last three years, four years, since you were presenting this and developing this, how are you feeling about this play in the Constitution and Proposition Opposition right now? Oof. Uh, <laughs> that's, that's such a big, good question. I, um, I have a lot of confusing feelings about it. First of all, let me say that the more I did the play and the more I, I first performed this play um, in its full version in 2015. So yeah. performing it in 2015 then throughout 2019 is the last time I performed it. Um, I, my feelings changed a lot and I actually started to um, really consider that abolishing this document might be the be important <laughs> um and I, I i don't i i don't know i would i wouldn't go out and say that but i started to feel more and more invested in that side of the debate the longer i performed it and the longer things went on in this country and i also started to question a little bit um I, I, you know, I think it's 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 very difficult for any of us to to see ourselves, right, and to see the ways in which we are situated. And I think we're in a moment, you know, where I can say I understand now that like even my innocence as a as a fifteen year old girl was in part because I I was lucky enough to grow up a, a white person, right? Like like even that innocence is something I sort of took for granted. Everyone had you know, when I was 15, of course, is not something some people don't have the luxury of that kind of innocence and sort of realizing that the more and more I perform the play and wondering um, about sometimes the danger of seeing both sides of, of, of being willing to go right between right. arguments and say, like, I see the other point of, of view rather than to say, like, actually, no, this is wrong. And I'm not going to try to stand in the shoes of, of the uh, Opposing. oppressive yeah. forces, you know, um, anyway, I, this is all to say that I became more and more confused and not more and not clearer as I performed the play, which I think is fine. I think I learned things performing it. I think I'm really struggling with like what I, I still deeply believe that 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 taking action is is crucial. And I still believe that that finding optimism in oneself is really important, that finding hope um, because I don't know how else we move forward or change anything if we don't do that. But um, yeah. I have I have become more confused about how how to do that. Right. So yeah. so when you were performing this, then Merrick Garland had been nominated, but no one would talk to him. Right. Yes. And Ruth Bader Ginsburg was still with us. Yes. She came to the play and sent you notes. She did. <laughs> yes, she did. Oh my God, I'm eating my heart out, Heidi. That is so <laughs> amazing. That is so amazing. It was really remarkable. What, what a gift you gave her. I mean, 
she must have been very, very happy. Um, <laughs> So we, but we, you are also performing it with the very real possibility that Trump could win again. Yes, yes. Uh, and you know, and I felt differently. I also performed it during the um, Kavanaugh hearings. Um, and then of course, once he was confirmed that during that time, many, many more people voted to abolish than had ever voted for that before. Like performing it during times when it seemed like obviously something about this system for many of us is not working. Um, uh, I, yeah, I, I, I have to say it was, my, my feelings changed on a nightly basis, sort of depending on what was going on in the, in the news as well, as, as did the audiences. And I could feel that, you know, you could yeah. feel what people were carrying in with them and it changed, that changed from night to night. Did you ever encounter people who are absolutely hostile to the yes. place? Absolutely. Yes. How did I got, they express it and what did they express? Uh, sometimes people left. Um, sometimes people left and then, you know, tweeted at me or blogged about it. Or um, I had a number of people, weirdly, I had a, a number of um, anti abortion activists reach out to me and I, I was terrified of those people. They were actually quite, um, the ones who reached out to me were very um, polite. And just wanted to have a conversation with me <laughs> to change my mind. Uh, right. I had people leave me kind of mean notes. You know, the audience can submit questions at the end, and I had people leave me, um, you know, criticize me or or calling me. You know, a lot of people talking about how I I hated men and things like that. Right. Right. Yeah. yeah. Oh, garden variety. Pretty garden variety. Yeah. Garden variety. Yeah. So, you know, the thing I didn't expect though is the amount of hatred I got online from the trailer for the Amazon film from people just furious that I would call the Constitution a living document. So apparently there's is. this, you know, has become like one of those phrases that deeply upsets um you know the 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 originalists and i guess there are I, I feel like there's a large group of people who considers them they consider themselves originalists who i don't really believe know completely what they're talking about but um i, I got a lot of um mean messages and emails and facebook messages from people angry that i called it a living document yes yes did you um foresee uh uh, the uh, the last Supreme Court justice coming. Did you think about that? I no. I really believed. I I, I think I believed she would live forever. Oh, I I had hoped. So. <laughs> I, I had certainly hoped. believed that she would. Yeah, that was, I think that's when I really started to, the, the hope that I could find um, in myself every night doing the play and doing the debate with my, you know, brilliant castmates Thursday and Rose Deli, I, I, when that happened, I really started to, I became like many of us, like de deeply depressed. And just try, trying to understand like how, how we do move forward with how the, the, the way the court is weighted right now. And also the fact that we haven't passed an amendment, you know, yes, in 20 years. And, and will we be able to ever ratify another amendment? Like, will it, it feels like what's happened now is it, it is a dead thing right now. Like we're really struggling to keep to keep things alive and moving forward. And I, I just have a lot of fear and, and d depression about that. I, I grew up as a kid, I'm, you know, I feel like if you're hit by a taxi in New York, you may be an actor on your way to audition. If you're hit by a taxi right in LA, you've got a, you're about to make a pitch. <laughs> and if you're hit by a taxi in Washington DC, you're on your way to visit a civil war battlefield. I mean, I, I really feel that's the kind of, so I've always had this paradigm where I look at, at the fact that we are not over the Civil War. We have never finished yeah. the Civil War. Um, we have never uh, 
talked about our original sin. We have never made reparations. No. We have never had a truth and reconciliation. Um, so I have not been balanced or, or even able to pretend that I'm balanced. I feel that whatever extremity we can use, all right, add more court members in making every branch more representative of the people who live here. Yes. What do yes. we So do we make it 12 members of the court? Do we, we as we should, add uh, Washington, D.C. as a state? Yes. Yes. Uh, God knows what would be the, the steps to, to getting rid of the Electoral College. I think that that may be too big an ask. But I do think that in the same way, if Mitch McConnell can refuse to meet with Merrick Garland, we need not be polite in things that the president can do to make the Supreme Court more representative. I agree with you. Absolutely. I agree that that whatever we can do and we shouldn't be polite to make the government more representative of the people is what needs to happen. Yeah. And I do think you're right. I do think, um, yeah, we haven't ever confronted our original sin. And, and I think there, I, I am, reparations need to happen. And uh, like there needs to, I, I feel like we will never move forward until, until we follow the lead of what happened in Germany or South Africa in terms of actually taking concrete action to confront right. Right. Um, the genocide and slavery and the horrors that were committed in the founding of this country. Yes, yeah. Well, I mean, the, so the good news is that we have a lot of means that are not dictated by the constitution. It's true, that is true. All of the penumbra areas, as you would yep. say. Yep. Are right there, rife to be explored and used. Yes. Um, uh, so uh, there's that. What else? I mean, other thoughts that you may have had just recently you know, in terms of it. Yeah. I actually recently, there's this great Jill Lepore article in the New Yorker recently about um, sort of arguing that constitutions in general have actually made uh, women's lives worse, uh, trans folks' lives worse people who are not cis white males lives worse because um, they actually, and this is where the Ninth Amendment and the penumbra comes in, they actually um, spell, out, by spelling out rights, they actually then deny rights. Like for example, abortion in this country was not, you know, illegal. <laughs> like abortions were happening and there were no laws against it until suddenly there were. And this idea that by spelling out rights, um, so, you know, suddenly women were explicitly not allowed to vote when in some places they have been voting. And I just find that very interesting, this idea that constitutions maybe actually rolled back rights rather than forwarded them for many people. Right. And I'm wondering if English is, is possibly a culprit here. Maybe. That, that there are not enough words that have openness to them. Yeah. I define. think like like the way you yeah. talk about men when they said men for the first right. time suddenly what did they mean in the 14th yeah. century yeah it meant it. every every woman was disempowered uh was was suddenly without rights yeah that's really that's yeah. really interesting yeah i like the you're right though just about language even the fact that we you know that we are now like finally moving into more widely and publicly acknowledging different kinds of gender expression. Yes. Like the fact that we have this very binary language system <laughs> is uh, probably holds us back, you know? Yeah. And, you know, this is another long rant, but um, uh, the other thing that I'm thinking is how imbued uh, originalists are in terms of um, uh, Christian religiosity that that yeah. makes an enormous, enormous impact um, yeah. uh, in ways that you'd probably be able to articulate more than, than me. But one of the things I just, I mean, I need to say it again. I, I feel that to have the courage to speak in public um, is something that until the Grimke sisters stepped out into the marketplace to talk about the ills of slavery, that, that we were policed as women. Um, and that as women, we, if we were in theater, we were not buried within church. Right. 
We were considered right. prostitutes. So there is a notion for me about when in this culture, in this country, are we allowed to be prodigal women? Every man is there talking about his own personal experience. No one is saying he's being confessional. No one is saying that he's breaking the taboos of his, of his gender. But I have such pride being a TCG writer now that uh, what the constitution means to me is um, published and out under TCG because you are the prodigal daughter um, that I think so many younger women need. And those of us of another generation, so many of us need to light our way forward. Um, and how wonderful that we've gotten to this point. Um, I, think, I think your writing um, is just extraordinary. And uh, I'm going to open it up if that's okay. Do you have any, any other thoughts? Because I would love to just sit here and ask you more questions. <laughs> I would love that too. When you come down, maybe we can have a drink. Yes, I and would love the, that. If you ever come up to Providence, it's only two hours to Wellfleet. All right, well, we're coming up to visit you. I want the girls to see where they were born. So we're coming yes. up. And I have a very child-friendly beach. That Great, I can... that's perfect. We're, we're coming now, to you then. This is becoming my <clears throat> New England godmother thing where <laughs> I love to dip babies, particularly babies of artists. You know, we will take you up on that. They have not been in the ocean yet. So oh, that's fantastic. Perfect. <laughs> we'll put them in the bay. There are no sharks in the bay. Okay, so um, let us see here the QA. Ready? Yeah, I'm ready. <laughs> okay. Um, this is from Allie. Both of your works have been incredible call to arms for us as citizens and live with us beyond the physical walls of the theater. I'd love to hear what your call to arms are as we prepare to go back into the theater. How do we come back better and safer for all artists, administrators, and theater goers and not return to the norms of the past? Good one. Oh, it's a great, timely question. I, uh, I wish I had all the answers to that. I certainly don't, maybe you do. I will say that I, um, you know, I mean, the, the theater industry works like every other industry in this country. And I do, I, I'm so happy we're at a, point when we are um, talking really openly about um, valuing um, artists and valuing workers and uh, looking for racial equity and gender equity. Now, the steps we need to take to make that happen are um, huge, but I feel like there are many amazing activists doing a lot of work to help shine the light in that. The um, Dear White American Theater, for example, folks are doing amazing work. I also think, I mean, I was very lucky on Constitution to work with producers who were um, uh, not only not abusive, physically abusive, uh, who also happened to um, really think about um, sh sharing, like I, I made more money doing my play than I think I would have working with most producers on Broadway. They were very conscious of, because of the kind of ethos of the show, of making sure that I got a good percentage, that I was paid well as an actor, that everyone was paid well. I made sure that every actor and uh, designer and a great number of uh, the, our stage managers and casting director got a percentage of the film money. Like. I, we we were really conscious when when Maria Dizia went on tour with the play. We made sure she had childcare paid for, that yeah. she had you know that everybody had what they needed, and that we were trying to model like the way I I think workplaces should be, which is like let's provide childcare, let's not yeah. make give artists the least amount of money in this whole like little organization like let's let the producers make a little less money and the artists make a little more money and so I just feel like we have to keep speaking up we have to keep supporting the groups of activists who are doing the work and I think anytime you're part of a structure you have to stand up and say like no we have to give child care <laughs> like yeah. yeah um fantastic okay uh is it sort of out of body for you when you see uh other actresses stepping into your shoes for regional productions? 
Yes, but I've only had one, I've only seen one actor do it, and it's the great Maria Dizia who actually coached me. <laughs> She's br brilliant, first of all. She actually was my acting coach when I first started performing at New York Theater Workshop. So yeah. it felt very easy in that way to do it. And then once I we started working, you know, in rehearsal, it, it started to feel like any other play. So I guess yeah. it was out of body. I was like, oh yeah, the play works better if Heidi is a little more innocent in this part or the play works better if Heidi kind of fully drops her persona there and I kind of forgot it was me. Did you feel more empathy for Heidi? I did, I did. And I also felt, uh, my friend David Ajami, the wonderful writer said- David Ajami. Yeah, he's the greatest. He who saw obviously me perform and then Maria perform said that he felt like uh, Maria had more empathy for Heidi than I did. <laughs> <laughs> I thought it was interesting. Interesting. Um, yeah. Here's a, uh, another question. Uh, this is from Nick from the New York Theater Workshop production. Oh, Nick, hi. <laughs> like, like during all of the productions, there were so many current events that resonated with the piece, it made the piece feel so alive. I actually think, Nick, this is just mine. I think it's gonna feel very alive 20 years from now too. Um, did you ever feel a need to pull a comment because of current events? What how uh, do you decide what to comment upon and what not to comment upon? I mean, in terms of like the the improv the improvs I would do in the show. Yeah. Yeah. Sometimes I I um I mean, first of all, the structure is pretty set, and some of the things I'd been talking about, you know, for ten years, they don't they don't sort of change with the news of the day. <laughs> A lot of the things in the show, but. Um, there were times when I was like, oh, I, I'm trying to think. Yes, when I, I, because I was sort of alive in the moment, I would think like, this is something that, that I need to like address today. If we're talking about child separation is, is in the news today, then when I'm talking about, you know, the, um, some of the immigration laws, I need to reference it or at least like hold that in my mind very presently when I'm talking about it. And then other things I might lose if it felt like this news was the thing that was on everyone's mind today. Yeah. 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 Um, someone said, wait, RBG sent you notes? My question yeah. is, what were they? <laughs> That's a great question. They, um, they were, one, she wanted me to change the language. I said that um, Jessica Lenahan's case would have turned out differently had there been an equal rights amendment. Um, and she wanted me to say it might have turned out differently, which she's absolutely right. There's no way I could know that. So I changed uh, from would to might have. And um, then she, in the debate, we talk about how the equal rights amendment could be ratified if we got the time limit removed. And she said, she wanted to make it clear that she thought we would have to start over, that the time limit could not be removed. Um, and I chose to respectfully disagree with her and keep that in the play. <laughs> yeah. 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 What a thrill. My gosh. What a yeah. Thrill. <laughs> yes. Um, someone wants to ask, how, how well could you see the audience members in those front row rush seats? Oh, very well. I, yes. I got to, I have friends that I made um, from those front people who came back to see it over and over are, are now friends of mine from the front row. Um, also, very often people in the front row would have um, pretty intense emotional reactions. And so I would, we would, yeah. you know, connect and look at each other. Yeah. This is from an audience member who was in the front row saying, I, I was there two years ago with my mother laughing and then sobbing. Um, Someone else says, okay, I think we've talked a little bit about the process of adapting the play for touring. Um, yes. In terms of how you, you really could adjust uh, watching it, uh, not performing it. Um, this, is, this is really, this is a, uh, it's like lighting a bomb and throwing it in. Um, All right, go for it. <laughs> even the Karen Olivo announced a few hours ago, they will be not, not she, will not be returning to Moulin Rouge due to industry silence, I did not know this, on Scott Rudin. How do you think your work, both you and Paula, can help continue this advocacy and push for change? How do we make, 
how do we make our workplaces less toxic? I mean, that's a terrific question. First of all, I have to say that I think Karen is incredibly brave, incredible performer. And what they did with that statement, I thought was um, really galvanizing and moving and important. I, I honestly, I made a statement when the article first came out on Twitter and was actually surprised that it was picked up by Playbill and other places that I had spoken out about it. It, it honestly seemed very, a little bit of a no brainer. I think we can all agree that like, you can't physically abuse people who work for you. It seems like a pretty easy statement to make, but then I realized how actually difficult it is because so many, I mean, I'm, I'm lucky that my income doesn't rely on Scott Rudin. And I'm in part lucky because I had producers who, like I said, gave me a very generous deal. It's possible if I'd been working for Scott Rudin, I wouldn't be as comfortable as I am now. And so I, 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 as I, say, I guess I'm saying these things are systemic. Like there's a lot of people whose livelihoods depend on the work that some of these producers do. And so like, I don't, I, I, I can't fault people for not speaking out. I don't think I realize quite maybe how scary people can consider it. And, and I guess I just want to say, I, I have, I think the fault is the abuser's fault. And yes, I think we all need to speak up, but I just want to say that I have empathy for people, whether or not they speak up because they're part of an abusive too. system. There, um, there are a lot of reasons that people don't speak up. There are. And uh, I want to say that Karen, what they did is incredible. Um, let right. me also say that I, I, I'm not sure what we, I don't have a single answer, but I will say that like whatever we can do when we're in positions of power to speak out, but also when we have some say over how workplaces operate again, like my, with my producers, we were tried to be very conscious about how, about paying people well, about yes. Yes. looking at work life balance, about providing childcare, about giving people points when we could. I think that more artists should um, you know, like what, ha what happened with Hamilton should actually have points in the projects they participate in and help develop and work on. I think that um, personally, I think that um, I, I have friends and I have a lot of friends who do theater in Europe and they were like, you perform eight times a week. That's bizarre. Like, I think that we need to look at work schedules. I think we need to look at like um, how hard life in the theater really is and, and ask ourselves why, why we're making it um, that difficult for people. Um, yes, sorry, I have a lot to say on it. And, uh, and again, I'm a little bit in the place of all confusion of you. about it. So, yeah. uh, one of the things that I feel that I've come to a point, um, and first of all, being of an older generation, I think I've recognized that I'm not going to break through the glass ceiling. Um, uh, I don't think that that was possible generationally for me as an out lesbian, but I'm, I'm happy beneath the glass ceiling. It doesn't matter um, uh, what I'm recognizing is that abuse is accumulative. It, 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 it becomes something that you bear in your body. And if I have the ability to make less money, tighten my belt, and work in a nice environment versus a toxic environment where I'm making a lot of money. And people will probably notice that I occasionally will leave projects and I will come up with as dignified an answer. I need to spend more time with the family or, you know, I'm, I'm allergic to pie crust or whatever it is, you know, to step back from a process when you feel it in your gut that part of the price is being demeaned by the process what do we have to do? So, uh, but part of this is speaking up about the Scott Rudins uh, of the world. And we have many Scott Rudins in our, yes. our world. And it would be uh, enormously helpful if the New York Times, when they're given a story, would publish those stories. Yeah, it would, it would be remarkably useful. Um, I'm not worrying about uh, ever working with, with Scott. I wish him well on his projects, if only for it's nice to have the economy running. But um, I, I also think that that behavior is not acceptable. 
So maybe we will get to a point, you know, the good thing right now is that you're coming from amazing television writing. And the great thing right now is that for all of the artists that have not been as visible as they should be, there's now a new conduit of uh, doing cable, of doing different platforms, of creating work out there that is well paid. Now it may not, it, there's still toxicity there, but, but it is well paid with benefits, with the ability to pay for childcare. So hopefully we are coming to a point where artists say, I will not take this role. I will not do this show. I am backing away. I'm taking this choice for my health. But we do need to be public about it, I think. Yes. Um, yes. And it shouldn't obviously all be on artists. And, and that's the big question, too, I guess, is how do we affect change? I mean, it's the same question we ask about the country, right? When we have like such disparity um, of wealth in this country. Uh, yeah. You know, I mean, it, this gets into larger questions of capitalism and how things work in this country. Like, I, again, you could say if people were guaranteed health care in this country, if people knew that um, they could survive without working for abusers, like that would go a long way toward eliminating abusers. Like it's, it's it there's would, a systemic uh, problem in this country. Like, yes, that it has to be attacked basically on every, uh, at every front, right? We have to like, do a multi-pronged uh, attack, basically. What are, what are we giving value to? And you're obviously talking about, and I think it shows in what the constitution means to me, you're talking about giving value to things that are collectively processed and produced all the yeah. way from club thumb up to setting up the tours. There's another way to produce in this country. Yes, there and is. Let's choose that path. And by the way, I'm thrilled that Scott Rudin didn't write email me. He emailed my producer saying, tell Paula Vogel to shut up or I'm going to hurt her. Um, Scott, I called you the next day to ask if you might take a phone call or if I could meet you in person. And my call was not answered, but it's still out there. The offer is still out there, Scott. I would love to meet you for coffee um, and find out why you wanted to hurt me um, because I was talking about uh, the cost of advertisement during the Tony Awards, which I think is a very valuable thing to have as a discussion. Absolutely. Um, I'm so sorry. That's oh, a terrifying phone call. It's kind of a thrill. And the question is whether to confront it then and then, you know, when you're battling for your show, right? you don't want that distraction. Um, and I didn't want to do that to the company. But right. Every single part of our process uh, down to the Pulitzer Prize and how that is awarded, down to who is hired for jobs in the administration of theater, yeah. down to who is getting the union jobs, we have got to diversify. We've been saying it for decades. Um, yes. And we're, we're really, I, I, and also we're, I mean, whatever, the, it's it's pathetic in every industry in this country, but but we're, it's really bad in the theater. <laughs> like we're very slow to change. It's it's remarkable. Yes, and, and a lot of that has to do with the fact that we're not funding it. But the one thing I do wanna say, which I think is great in terms of what the constitution means to me and in terms of you, is that the truth of the matter is, is that there is a living to be made in theater. And from theater, we go to uh, all of the other forms of media. Um, what do you hope for, and this will be our last question, what do you hope for theater in the post-pandemic world story-wise? How do you think theater can meet this moment to help people process the intensity and grief of the last year without telling literal stories? That's a great question, Alyssa. I, like many people, I, I'm finding it hard to imagine what theater will be now or what kind of stories I even want to see. I'm excited to discover what that is. I will say, I, like you said earlier, I think there's just a remarkable group of young writers coming up. And I, I, I was recently got to read a bunch of plays for a sort of panel I was on and um, just plays that are speaking to this moment, like Alicia Harris's work, um, yeah. 
what to send up when it goes down. I, I was really shaken to my core by that play and also um, so moved by it as, as putting theater out into the world as a, as a ritual, as a collective uh, act of um, mourning and reconciliation and examination and challenge. Um, it felt like it would feel like a, ch a church service. Probably I didn't get to see it in person. I can't wait and hope that I, I will get to in the future. I think that I will because I think that it's happening. Um, so I, I guess like that, that play really stood out to me as, as something I look forward to returning to, to theater, particularly when we've all been separated for so long and can't see or be in one another's presence or, you know, hear each other breathe or touch one another to have theater that feels like it's about us being in the room together. Um, the, the kinds of stories that can only happen when people are in a room together that can't be easily translated to TV. <laughs> uh, those are the things I want to experience. That sounds wonderful. I, I want to experience that too. And um, the last note that I just want to add to the conversation is that something I think we both know as women artists that for every play that does the impossible of making it to Broadway, we know there are a hundred other plays that are wonderful written by women and BIPOC writers. Um, and, you know, having just done the Yale Prize, I've read about 300 plays in the last two months. And I just feel we're so blessed. So we have to get out of the system of the survival of the fittest as a way of selecting yes. a play or a playwright. Um, and instead find a way that uh, the supply increases the demand. Um, the demand will increase if we increase the supply, I think. So um, I can't- can, can I say one thing about that? I know we have to end, but I also think we don't realize the way, you know, having a success on Broadway is, is very exciting and it does affect like what plays go down in history. But I grew up being most influenced by your plays and by the plays of Maria Irene Fornes. And I was actually shocked to learn that Indecent was your first play on Broadway. In, in my mind, all of your plays had been on Broadway because I grew up in Wenatchee and, and I read your plays. And the same with Maria Irene Fornes. I think she had a play for one day on Broadway that closed after one night. Yeah. yeah. But to me, she's like the greatest playwright of all time. She's the greatest so, playwright. We agree on that. She's my yeah. Yeah. She's absolutely my goddess. So, I mean, again, what do we give value to? Yeah. I, I give value to having enough, enough, not having too much. I think Agreed. we're much happier with having enough than too much. And so I'd rather take all of those resources and be able to have, you know, a theater on every block yep. with these amazing, you know, younger voices or older voices coming back. I'm exactly with you. So, um, yeah, and it wasn't fair. You know, I, I have to say the best thing about being on Broadway was being there. It was also Lynn Nottage's first time. Yes. And yes. to have, you know, a sister in that race was fantastic. Yeah. Uh, so I, I enjoyed sneaking in the tequila in my purse, the only <laughs> that we could enjoy during the uh, award ceremonies. Um, so I, I hate this. I wish I could just say, hey, Heidi, let's, let's go to the bar now. <laughs> um, and let's all, all of the people, these wonderful people here from the Center for Fiction and TCG, let's go to the bar. Um, uh, but I know that uh, the, the, the twins are waiting and um, sure <laughs> yeah. you have much to do. I just want to say congratulations. I just want to express the thanks that's streaming in on this question and answer. Thank you, Paula. Given us. It's extraordinary. And um, I, you've, You've changed my DNA as a writer. Um, and I am in your debt. So please come up with the, with the kids. I will. <laughs> Thank you, Paula. And, uh, and let us cook for you. Um, and just, I hope, on to the next and the next and the next for you. Thank you. I look forward to seeing you. And I look, thank you for your plays. And I look forward to more. Right at you. All right, thank you all. Thank you, everyone. Thanks for your great questions. Thank you both. That was amazing. Thanks. So wonderful. Thanks, everyone. Oh, thank you. The way I popped at the screen. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs>